Good afternoon. I'd like to call this meeting of the Juvenile Detention Board of Managers to order. If we could all rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right, as always, our first item of business is for public comment. Um, and as always, there's public comment at the beginning and the end. Um, the outset public comment is, is only for items that are on the agenda this afternoon. So if any member of the public has anything to say. Seeing and hearing none. Um, the next item is an approval of the minutes from the November meeting. Is there a- I'll move for approval of the minutes. Second. Uh, any comments or questions? All in favor? Aye. Aye. The opposed, the ayes have it. Uh, the next item is the monthly report from Juvenile Court and Probation Services. Ms. DiMatteo. Good evening. Um, so today the census population is two, uh, one at Montgomery County and one at Aspire. Um, the young man who is at Montgomery County uh, was transferred there because Aspire had reduced their population. So he's been at Montgomery County for 18, 18 days and he was at Aspire for 25. Any questions from the board? Do you have an update on, um, at our last meeting there were uh, some issues with uh, youth that had fled? Has, has that been resolved? Uh, no, some are still remain on uh, as absconders, have not been located. Mm -hmm. um, others have been located. Um, new monitors were installed. Uh, some of those have cut the monitor and then we were able to locate them and, and we're, we're doing more of that. We're doing more of the locate, uh, restrap the monitor, continue monitoring back to court. Um, we have a few individuals who are actually waiting for court commitments to uh, treatment programs, but they're waiting at home because there was no bed. So. And is there any, are there any, I guess, absconder is the word, are there any right now? Uh, I'm certain there are, I couldn't tell you the number. Okay. Is that a, just a matter of course? They're yes, almost I mean, always... there's, yeah, there's, yeah. there's individuals who will disappear while on supervision without a monitor mm -hmm. uh, or prior to getting a monitor just in the general course of supervision warrants would be issued and, until they're apprehended and then generally placed on a monitor um, unless there's new or other needs that are presenting okay thanks any other questions great thank you this afternoon, we invited, I think it was Dr. Taylor was your suggestion, right? Uh, for um, Dr. Edelberg from the Delaware County Intermediate Unit to speak to the board and to the public about uh, just generally speaking, what the DCIU's work had been prior to uh, the shutdown of Lima um, and perhaps what's, what's gone on since. So well, thank you for coming in. Yeah, thank you for inviting us to come. With me is Dr. Kevin Kane, who is the assistant to the executive director for student services. Um, Ms. Kim Mecca is also gonna be presenting about the program. And of course, I'm Dr. Maria Edelberg. So we're really happy to have the opportunity to come here and talk to you tonight. I thought what is gonna be important, regardless of what happens with the detention center, where are some of the laws and regulations that will govern whatever happens, whether it's looking at reopening a detention center or even if the county makes the decision, we're gonna to go to day treatment centers where you're adjudicating a youth to a treatment center and then they go home in the evening. 
So in Pennsylvania, we have what's called uh, Act 30 of 1997. And really kind of when we look at that act, there's a couple key provisions. One is we're looking at what we would call the residential center. So the residential center here would be the detention center. It's also the prison. Um, and you could also look in the past, Delaware County has had day programs where kids were adjudicated to day programs either through the court system and or through the CYS system. And when a student is a, put into one of these facilities, the reality of that facility is <coughs> kids have to be educated by school code within that facility. And you know, one of the things it takes a lots of cooperation and collaboration amongst the school district and where the student lives, and we often call that the homeschool district, the host school district, where the facility is located. So for example, Lima was located in the Rose Premedia School District, and you think the prison is also in Garnet Valley School District. There used to be the Be Proud program, which was also located at one point Southeast Elko School District, and then the Rose Tree Media School District. So we always say when somebody is in one of these facilities, adjudicated and or placed through CYS, we are guests, education is guest within that facility. And so much of what we do is based on the confounds of what is set up. So for example, like at the detention center, students need to be brought down. Um, and if they're brought down to education, where they're ready, able to serve, if they're not brought down, a lot of times there's things happening within the environment that could impact them actually accessing education. Then the way the, the regulations work is wherever the facility is, that host district is required to provide the education. And the majority of the time, the host district contracts with the Delaware County Intermediate Unit to provide the educational services. And so we'll go in and we'll set up a program for the educational piece. And Ms. Mech is gonna talk through what we have done at the detention center um, about the, the actual education program. And I think the other thing that's really important is we, especially at the detention center, you can get kids in for 24 hours, 72 hours, 10 days, but typically the length of stay is very short. The other piece is when a student is in the detention center or a day treatment center, and most of the time day treatment centers, we do see um, students who are placed there for longer periods of time. It's not uncommon that they're placed there for a year, six months. But specifically at the detention center, students will come in. We have to, as part of the education system, notify the homeschool district that we have a student because there's this collaboration of we're responsible and we do this on behalf of the host district to coordinate with the home school district that you have a student at the detention center trying to get records and technically when 10 days we're supposed to get all the records but i think the big piece of this is you're constantly having kids in out in out and within a 72 hour period you might see a student and then not see him the next day sometimes we know students are being discharged, sometimes we don't know students are being discharged. It's just the way the system works. Kim's gonna talk a little bit about when students come to the educational program, what that has looked like. So I'm gonna turn it over to Kim. I have in the packet, and um, I think it's slide six, to kind of give you, if we wanted to, we can circle back to some of this, this slide and information related to the in enrollment history of the Delaware County Intermediate Unit since um, 2010, 2010 to present. Um, you know, it highlights the declining enrollment. I think there's lots of reasons why there's declining enrollment, especially for some of the initiatives um, in the adjudication system. Um, we've talked about, this slide is just to represent the level of teaching and staffing required when that enrollment is high and the measurements and strategies that we've implemented in order to meet the needs and the demands uh, based on those enrollment trends. Um, you know, we'll share a little bit about what some of those options could look like and um, how we can facilitate education at the um, program and what that might look like. So we'll be more than happy to talk about that as well. Um, 
I'm going to I'm going to go to here right now and then we'll circle back to some of those that other information. But this is the typical structure of the day um, at the detention center prior to um, COVID. So um, what's important to highlight is that 90 percent of the students really do enjoy going to school. Um, it is the highlight of their day. Um, it is something that they look forward to. Um, and, you know, we're really happy uh, with the programs that we've been able to offer, not only from a community perspective, but mentoring as well. Um, so you'll see that there are different categories of groups. Um, the detention center grouped most by their living unit, um, C, D, E1, and E2. C was the intake unit. A lot of kids would stay in the C unit um, until they were assessed. Um, we can determine district of residence. Um, there'd be a lot of things that would be happening for those intake students, physicals, dental appointments, um, contacting that district of residence like Dr. Edelberg had mentioned, and making sure that we got what we could from their district of residence, exams, projects, curriculum, what that looked like for that student. Then um, they would titrate to different groups based on behavior. Um, and we had seven periods throughout the day, 45 minute periods, and they would cycle through um, depending on all of those variables that I had mentioned um, prior to that. They did have to eat one at a time in, their un in, their, in the cafeteria. They would only have one living unit at a time to have communal meals. And that's the breakfast and lunch schedule. So we would work around that. Um, and it's important to say that, you know, anything, any barriers that we faced during the educational component, we would um, make the necessary changes in order to meet the needs of the students. Um, I think we're very proud of something we call the book club. I don't know if you had an opportunity to hear about that from other individuals. Um, you know, it would highlight books that kids have read. They would have posters on the wall. You know, it was uh, something that they would share back with their districts as well. You know, we composed books um, and it just provided a leadership opportunity for these students to celebrate um, things in their life. We also had, you know, um, community connections with um, vendors and uh, community organizations that were willing to share their story for the students. And we looked at offering that opportunity at least once a month. Um, physical education and counseling was also provided. And I'd be happy to answer any questions that you might have about it. Questions for the board? I just have one. What is mental health? Maybe you said that, I missed it. So there, um, you know, we have a Ven uh, children's guidance center would come and work with students on either individual or group issues that were they were processing related to mental health while they were in the program. Okay. Do you want to speak to any other slides or? So, I mean, I, I do think that the big um, issue is, you know, for, for us um, at Delaware County, we really try to work within the structure and work with the students that Dr. Have, can you just go to the mic so that sorry, sorry. people watching are able we really try to work with the students that came to us and, and i think one of the things that's very unique about the type of programming is you don't know the age of the student you don't know the grade of the student and how do we get a student in most of the time we had to find a record of where they were functioning because a lot of times you know, we didn't have their school records upon the very first day. So really kind of that first 24 to 72 hours was trying to do some mini assessments to try to get some levels of where students are, trying to look at what their curriculum was back home so we didn't be, miss a beat. And if not, we would do a lot of what we would call kind of current event type topics to look at what was going on. So we could look at reading the paper, we can look at life type skills that students needed. You know, one of the things that we really have to look at when the program opens up again, and whether that is this year, whether that is next year is, um, or 
if the county is going to look at not only a detention center but a day treatment center, you know, is there a possibility of doing anything either web-based or remote? Now we know that is a very that's a hurdle that we would have to come over, right? Because having somebody access the internet while incarcerated, even if it's for a short time, that has been a barrier. But there are lots of different things that are going on out there from an educational perspective. And we are looking at various types of like online programs that might not bring you into a web-based system, but it's something that can be downloaded and then worked with within the educational environment. So one of the, you know, I always like to say in the worst of situations, there's positives that come out of it. And I think as educators, we have learned an awful lot about how to do things differently in education after the pandemic. So when things open up, I think the real conversation would need to be, is there a way to access? So if somebody is in their home district or is there a curriculum that we can even get materials over and use in a classroom? So how would that look like now that we're in a environment where we have possibilities that we never had before. You know, and so I, I think that as we look, we've always had a robust education program, but again, I, I really need to say that it's a collaboration and a cooperation between the detention center and honoring and respecting the barriers that they have and the issues that they might have with students, getting students down, you know, and I think one of the other pieces is we had to have education, but we also had to have somebody from the detention center with the students, you know, so it really is a collaborative process between the detention center and DCIU or whoever is providing education uh, because we have to work together to meet the needs of the students that we have. And so, you know, we're happy to talk about what things might look like. Yes. Um. I know you asked for questions on the other slides. One sure. of the things that I'm circling around that you said earlier was that it t that law requires you gain records within t at least by 10 days. And then you just said the average stay is 10 days. So I'm kind of curious about the operational challenges and how that's affecting the quality of the education that the students are experiencing while they're there. Yeah, there are. It's a good point because, you know, often we will have the police record is really important because it's going to give us um, address if it is truly their address and it is truly who they are. Um, but that's the starting point to nail down the information that we need and we will you know, we have a very collaborative relationship with all of the surrounding areas and and you know um, that contact um, is really important in those relationships that are, we have formed um, in order to get those educational records um, you know even working in a registration office in a typical district that can be very challenging for out of state out of county um, but you know that wouldn't uh, delay our ability to assess and to provide programming regardless. It's definitely an advantage and helps, um, you know, accurately um, provide that continuum so there's no gap. But um, yeah, that, that is a requirement. We don't necessarily have all of the right pieces in order to make it happen as swiftly and quickly as we'd like. Do you, and this is my last question, do you guys have any information or like research or data related to when students return, are they still on grade level when they return back to their home school? That's a really good question. Um, we do not collect that data specifically, um, but it, it would be something that we could obtain. You know, um, there's a way for students to be identified through Pennsylvania Department of Education. Everybody has their unique identifier. You know, that that um, initiative started in 2015 where they have a code. So that code allows us to go into the state, Pennsylvania state system. So out of state can be a little more difficult. Um, and we can see their educational um, trajectory. Well, trajectory might not be the right word. Where they, their history is, is the word I was looking for. So we'll be able to um, be able to identify where they are now and be able to, you know, get that information. Good question, though. 
I guess following up on that, um, what does what would a, a warm handoff look like between you and the district when they're returning back to the district? A lot of um, uh, another good question. So transition is really important and a transition plan that coordinates all the services that are necessary to wrap around a student who is, you know, titrating back from a detention center environment to a school setting, communication, guidance counselors, um, teachers, special education directors, most often. And like I said, we have um, a lot of that information. If there's any crisis plans or mental health, mental health treatment plans that have been generated um, to make sure that we have those records available if we know when and how that's happening. Sometimes that, was the, that can be some of the barriers. So would that look like it, like a, a formal IEP for the that it can kid? Be. Or? It can be, it can be a meeting um, if they're identified as a student with special education mm -hmm. services. It could be, um, you know, the ability to communicate more effectively in light of uh, COVID has helped us in a lot of ways. We can have IEP meetings on the spot with a lot of people and varying schedules in order for that to happen, but it can be. You know, if we wanna look at a barrier, here's a real barrier, is if a student comes in and they're there for 10 days or less, it it's, you know, I, I don't wanna make it sound like, you know, we can do all this magical stuff, but I do think one of the, the big issues is, is, we, when we know a student is actually leaving, we can do some good planning. To be frank, sometimes we don't even know a student's leaving. They have a, a date. Next thing you know, we're back in and we're told the student has left. You know, I think one of the things that Ms. Mecca talked about is our relationships with a lot of the districts. And when we're dealing with students who have made it to the detention center, some of them are special needs and when they're special needs because of the IEP process, in some ways it's easier to wrap them with services because a lot of times either the district knows that we have the student, they're gonna call an IEP when the student is um, discharged. Uh, but we also get a fair amount of students that don't have an individualized education plan. So I, I do think out of all of the situations, we get students in, sometimes it takes us 24 hours just to get the name, the address, make those connections. Sometimes we make those connections and if it happens on a Thursday, Monday, they might not even be in the detention center again. So those are natural barriers, but I have to say, we have always had a pretty good relationship with the detention center and we do try to work through issues um, and those levels of communication. And so I, I have to kind of just put out there that there's multiple systems that are involved and when it works really well, we have a little time to do some really good stuff. Um, and then, you know, it's also not uncommon to have students maybe come back and we have some records on them as well. So I think there's like so many different dynamics when we're looking at the educational program at the detention center. Um, and how we work and wrap students. And I think one of the nice things about an intermediate unit, and you can probably find this in different counties when the intermediate unit is involved in what we would call a corrections education, is because of the network of how we work with our school districts and our charter schools and our non-public schools, we become that connector for a lot of times that child and family. Um, and you know that has been a strength because of intermediate unit systems. Um, can you explain a little bit um, the difference in the way you look at this if it's a day treatment versus detention center sure. delivery? So let's typically, okay, in the past in Delaware County, when you've had day treatment centers where kids, and two ways kids would get into the day treatment center, they were adjudicated in or placed through CYS. Most of the time when this occurred, it wasn't a short-term placement. A student might be there for a semester. A student might be there for the year. So what that does is it really has the opportunity to work with that child and also work with the family and work with the school district of residence to be able to plan for that student. And then typically the day treatment center will provide all the mental health services. And again, being that connector, they'll come in. Um, and again, 
we have been using, we had the day treatment center, we would have an online curriculum. And the reason for that is you could have 10 students that are placed there. They could be at all levels. So you wanna be able to, how do you keep them invested in education, but also academically continuing to move forward so the placement doesn't create a learning loss for that child. Um, and using an online curriculum in a day treatment center, and I'm gonna tell you, they're so much better today than they were when the county had a, a program like that four or five years ago that we can really stay connected with a child within their home district. So I, I like to say, if it's, it's a day treatment center, you're able to also develop those relationships with the child because they're coming to school, they're also going home. There is that homeschool connection that you're working with through the mental health supports through the treatment center. But then the day program, it also allows time to, maybe a child is with us, and there we're seeing that there's some challenges. And it's not uncommon when a child is placed in a day treatment center, if we start looking at their educational history, we're seeing losses through the history because they've been absent from school. And so one of the things that we have been able to do in these day treatment centers is to evaluate, is this a child with special needs or is it a child who really just missed education because of the ins and outs? And then how do we really target those skill sets to help them advance and maybe make some progress because here's the reality, they're required to be in that program every day because if they're not, the consequences are pretty great. And most of the time they're going to placement. And so there is sometimes that carrot that maybe takes a student who would not likely be in school every day if they were back in their home district. This is that carrot that gets in there. And that's where that opportunity happens where we can help students develop academically but also identify if there's gaps in learning and how do we fill those gaps in. I hope I answered your question. Yes, so a day treatment program is not secure. It is not secure. Hmm. That being said, you know, I think there, and this is just my own opinion, there's value to a day treatment center. And it's a way of keeping kids in the county, keeping them at home at night, having them go into a program where you're providing those wraparound services for that child and because they're associated with probation, that if they are not following what they're supposed to follow, the next level of consequence is a higher level. And I, you know, I always like to say most kids are really good kids. We just have to get the right environment for them to thrive. And day treatment programs help with that. Um, and so that's what I think is a big difference when you have a day treatment center versus only a detention center and there's value of both i think you just have to get the right match where the student's skill sets and where their life is at that point yes two questions i heard you say that sometimes you don't get notice when children are being released from detention you don't get much notice so i'm just making a note that the sources for that information would be the private attorney public defender maybe the cys worker or more of the or maybe somebody from juvenile probation do you get that information from any of those sources After, prior to the child being released? Not necessarily, and I'm not sure they always know when they're going to a date or court that that child is gonna be released, that, that that's how sometimes we know. But if you did have that, obviously that would be helpful. It would be helpful. Okay. I know, and I, and I also, I wanna be really clear, if a child is there for a day or two, and to be totally transparent, it's really hard to do much in, in that time frame. It's really when we have students 10 days or longer, which is not the norm either in a detention center, is where we can help to build uh, those relationships and put some better plans in place. Okay, and so trauma-informed care, I assume, is part of what you're doing for these, these children who need it? Yes, okay. and in, in fact, um, Delaware County Intermediate Unit mm -hmm. uh, with Behavioral Health in the DA's office actually got a grant, a federal grant called Stop It, and it's all about trauma-informed and working with our districts. And, and so we've had a strong partnership with the county to help really lead the efforts around trauma-informed education. Okay. Have you had any relationships with any of the uh, groups in the uh, community, for instance, the fraternities or sororities in the community to try to reach out to them, or have they reached out to you to see if they could in some way help you in uh, helping these, these juveniles? That has not been a big focus. Okay. And they have not reached out to you as far as that is correct. Okay. 
Thank you. Any other questions? Any other questions from the board? Well, I appreciate the opportunity for uh, Ms. Becca and I to be here, and we are always available uh, to help in any way we can to partner with the county to better serve our community. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you for presenting. All right, next on the agenda for today is our committee reports. Um, Ms. Schaefer, Human Resources? Oh, well, I don't really have a report. I mean, we have our new director, um, beginning, I think he's coming in January? January 4th. January 4th. Yep. So I would suggest that our next, our first order of business in January is for the committee to, you know, once he figures out where the bathroom is and everything, mm -hmm. um, to meet with him and to, you know, ask him how we can support him and how he envisions moving forward. Yeah, I, I think um, Mr. Irizarry will certainly be at our going mm -hmm. forward meetings. And I think that's going to be just part of mm -hmm. the nature of our meetings is that he's going to be here. Yeah. yeah. So uh, I'm not even really sure we need a human resources committee now that we've. Well, when he our... decides what his plan is mm -hmm. and his um, course of action, it may be that we can be useful, you know, given our uh, short staffed situation in our personnel department. Okay, fair enough. Um, facilities contract, I think the main update would come from Mr. Lazarus. So Howard, if you'd like to sure. report in. Good afternoon. Um, I'm gonna start by thanking you for your patience as we work through the uh, challenges that we've, um, we have in, in getting through an agreement. Um, the main um, concern that I've found that Chester County has is very much similar to what we have is that it's a staffing matter. So in my last conversation with their director of human services, it really boiled down to if we can come up with staffing, then they can actually turn a pod in their um, juvenile detention center over to us. One of the concerns that has been raised is how do we know that we'll have spaces when we need them, because really what we're doing with Chester County now is a space available type arrangement. And there's always the opportunity for them to not accept someone based upon behavior or special needs. So in talking to their, their director, um, he was very honest with me that if we can find a way to staff um, a 12 bed pod, then we could actually have it at our use, at our sole, at our sole use, and the spaces would be there for us. So that's the agreement that we're working on. Uh, when I spoke to him yesterday, the intent was to try and get it before um, the Delaware County County Council at their January 5th meeting, and then their uh, Board of Commissioners would approve it. Um, that means that we'd had to go back to State Attorney General and try and get some of the staff who were tied up in the investigation uh, cleared so that they could be employed, again, reemployed by Delaware County and provide that staffing. Um, so we've, we've initiated that process as well. So those things work out. We'll be in the fortunate position of having some dedicated spaces for our use that we can count on. There's also the, still the ability to have space available use um, in the Chester County facility as well. So that's really the status of, of where we are in terms of the contract with Chester County. I know it's taken a long time, but they're going through a lot of the same things we are in terms of their staffing and their ability to provide, um, to, to, to address conditions that come up. The one thing that in talking to uh, the public defender that really didn't think about was a separate facility for uh, young women who are placed in our care. And that's something we can, for the time still work through the space available, but it's another issue that we need to bring to the table and discuss. So that's where we are. So um, if the if it becomes problematic um, to make any progress with the AG and that investigation, which would be my guess, um, would are we precluded from recruiting just uh, on the market for to, to staff that? We're not. Okay. So, so my recommendation will be let's get the form of agreement done and we'll work on staffing at the same time. And if, well, no, I think within this, 
you know, fairly quickly whether we can um, get some clearance. We haven't had a lot of challenge with the AG and some other positions, but I don't think we've taken on the discussion of the uh, detention officers directly with the AG. The, the um, county staff who has been cleared have really been in non-custodial roles, so that's moved, those have moved pretty quickly. But to be clear, we do have a line of communication with the AG's office surrounding... We do. You know, uh, Mr. Martin, the, the county solicitor, has reached out. And when I spoke to our district attorney this afternoon, he also offered his um, goodwill and attempts to, to get that cleared as well. Yeah. Does this board need to make a recommendation to council on the contract? Yes. Yeah, um, so similar to the jail oversight board? Um, I, I think w w there's been some conversation of, about how exactly to manage that mm -hmm. in the interest of the fact that this is an urgent matter. Right. Um, we don't want it to be held up by the cadence of our meetings and how they relate to county council. But to your point, we also have to make sure that this board can weigh in on, uh, um, you know, it recommend or not recommend right. a contract for council to approve. So I think for today's meeting, and um, I'll look at our solicitor as well, um, I think the idea is for us to, you know, weigh in based on where we stand on what the county is pursuing, mm -hmm. um, get our input collectively on what we think of the, you know, the approach. Um, but understand that we don't have a contract in place before us to, to formally approve. Okay. Um, I, I thought I, maybe I misunderstood. It sounded like council was going to be approving the contract in January. Well, well, I'm going to try and get it before council as quickly as we can due to the sense of urgency. I know that sure. that may be going through the wickets a little out of order, but it's, it's something of a compelling nature. But to finish the point I was making, so we can have a conversation today um, and, you know, from where we are now to okay. a contract that's ready for council, mm -hmm. we can opine online, you know, via email. Okay. Um, any changes from the conversation today to what a final agreement is for council to approve? Um, Ms. Smith? Is there yeah. a draft? Is there a draft of an agreement? Not or, yet. Not yet. Or an oh. overview of what? The expenses will be the duration of the contract. I mean, I appreciate the urgency, but also want to manage the accountability of. Certainly. So, Howard, what other details can you provide at this point? Um, when I spoke to um, a gentleman from Chester County, the to me the primary issue is getting their buy-in about us staffing um, a dedicated pod. I think the issues that deal with cost that deal with um, any potential liability assurances we need to provide for things that legally we can work out. It's really been difficult, though, to get to a point of agreement on the availability of the, of the uh, spaces, and that's been my priority. So can I clarify something? We are not actually staffing it. We would be provide, recruiting, basically, and they would still be under Chester County's employee mm -hmm. rules and employees of Chester County. Not necessarily. Uh, my my conversation with uh, Pat yesterday was they would be county the Delaware County staff. So we're basically like renting space there. That's correct. Is there an intended duration for the contract? Yeah. Good question. When I first spoke to them, we had talked about it being in place for a year, as a minimum, and then we would look at renewals after that. And during that one year period, we would have to. Uh, Come, you know, I'd have to get direction from this board as to how you wanted to proceed with the um, with the juvenile detention center. Presumably, they want some degree of time commitment for them to take the infrastructural changes they're going to be making. But also, you know, we don't want it to be too long of a commitment. Is that right? Yes. We had also talked, I don't know if it was last meeting, because I was on the phone, or the meeting before, about potentially visiting these locations. Is, is, were we waiting for Mr. Ayer, like a staff person to start working that out? Because um, that was also something that we, we talked, talked about. We talked about waiting until uh, our manager was on board, and I think that was the response I got from, from folks by email. Okay. The timeline of this is Let me also clarify one thing. So when this comes before council, it, it's typically subject to solicitor's approval. Um, we can also have, and, and you know, I don't want to step outside of my, my realm, but Ms. Smith, what other sort of subject to might we have for 
councils, I mean, it really, this is a question for the county solicitor, not for you, at least, but I'm not sure if you- Well, I can speak to the jurisdiction of the board. Sure, and please. Per perhaps answer that. So, uh, Shelley Smith, I'm, I'm a solicitor to the Juvenile Detention Board of Managers. Um, the board can, um, the, the board can discuss um, the contract issues to the extent Mr. Lazarus has details here. Um, the board can um, subsequently, when there is a draft of an agreement, um, discuss that um, virtually. And then if um, the board takes a position, can ratify that at a subsequent meeting so that the Sunshine Act requirements are satisfied. Um, and then, again, I don't want to get out of my lane either, but council can also, uh, because this board's uh, jurisdiction is really advisory on a contract issue like this, um, council could certainly um, take a vote on the contract subject to um, the action taken by the Juvenile Detention Board of Managers as contemplated by the uh, authority that's given to the board. Well, I mean, to me, the most important thing is that once a draft is on paper that these members are given the chance to weigh in and give input before it goes to council. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, right. and that's what I'm saying. That can happen virtually right. rather than at a meeting. And then this board can take a formal, because of the urgency, council could take its action subject to um, the, the formal action by this board. And then this board could ratify whatever virtual action it might have previously taken if that happens at its next meeting. Hmm. So I think, you know, look, we, let's see how the time frame proceeds with Chester County, but I think we have a number of means to ensure that this board has adequate opportunity to weigh in on a draft before it's approved by council, by county council. And I would just like to add, I, I'd like to see the agreement cover, address the girl situation. Um, and I mean, from the few months that we've been getting these reports, they're few and far between, you know, it's, it is not the numbers of the males. So I, I would imagine they could accommodate us with the old system, you know, if mm -hmm. we have room and if there's not a behavior issue well, for the most part. I can certainly, I can certainly address it as we talk about the uh, detailed contractual language and just, you know, to be respectful of, of the board of managers, it's not my intention not to go through the proper process, but the two things that I've been that have been driving my trying to push this fast. One is the um, the location of the facility that's more more accessible for family members, because that's been a concern that's raised. The second is really um, really a conversation I had with Judge Kelly um, Saturday evening about changes in federal law about pre. Um, pre-arraignment confinement of, of young offenders. And come Tuesday, it's a real issue for him, which I guess is today. Um, and I'm trying to be responsive to that concern as well in the event that there are um, there are issues that come up. So I, um, I I would also long for the day where everything's not done under, a, um, and under that kind of urgent, almost crisis uh, frame. But I'll certainly make sure that as I bring things forward, be mindful, respectful of the uh, legal and governing uh, authority of this board. Is, uh, is there any term sheet at all, like number of staff? Like we've got a, nothing? Well, not yet. Not yet. It's I mean, been all. I, in all, in all fairness, I, I, I appreciate being able to get a grip, but it is December 21st today. I know. Um, mm -hmm. There's closed, the, the county's closed. Friday, Monday, and then the following Monday's the third, and then the agenda meeting would be the fourth for council. That's really an accelerated schedule. Um, I, yeah, again, and this goes to my point earlier. Yeah. I, I think we, we don't know how much this is going to okay. proceed. I, I think yeah. we've heard all the reasons each month as to why this is important. Yeah, that I think we it's a good idea. I mean, I've always thought this is a great tool to have in yeah. the toolbox. It's just that if it's using up part of our the budget and there's you know capital to get the pod ready staff member I, I i just it's just a lot in a short amount of time understood 
so we'll use the mechanisms we have, whether it's email or an executive session or whatever, to make sure that this board has the opportunity to weigh in on a formal agreement um, before council votes on it. I mean, the, our next board meeting would be the 18th, which is the same Tuesday as our second council yeah. meeting of January, yeah, exactly. which might allow for our new manager to be on board mm -hmm. too and everyone too. Yeah. So let's see how it proceeds. Mm -hmm. Where is the Chester facility, Chester County? It's um, it's on the same general. It's on the same campus as their um, prison. I'm trying to remember. Yeah, so right, down route, right down Route Route One. It is not far out of the county. Maybe two miles. Oh really? Make it right. So it's not that far out of Delaware County. Okay. So well, that's okay. great. Yeah. That's yeah, it's really not that bad. <clears throat> it's not too far, much further than Glen Hills. Then, uh, sorry. Uh, uh, right before Longwood Gardens. I don't know where that's. Okay. Like peak or something. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Maybe we can even plan the, the trip to the site within like the yeah. first two weeks of um, yeah. January, if no, that's possible. So after we've been it's our responsibility to New direction. Yeah. yeah, again, that was the idea it was we, I think yeah. folks from email said they wanted to wait until Mr. Irizarry was on board. Right, that's what I'm saying, so he'll be on board on the floor. Yep, agreed. All right, any other questions for Mr. Lazarus? All right, thank you, sir. Thank you. Is he still up for still up status of JDC uh, or yes. Central? <laughs> yes. Good point. Thank you. Um, so we have, as I think I reported last time, we do have a um, an architect engaged under the on-demand architectural services contract that the county has. Um, the one missing link was for him to talk to our president judge, which is scheduled this week. After that, the architect will prepare some conceptual drawings. We'll bring them back to the board before we go forward with any detailed design. There is, um, just as an uh, affiliated part of that, is there's also the uh, intent to take part of the facility and use it as a central processing um, facility. And that work um, has been through that kind of conceptual process. And we'll come back with um, appropriate drawings well, before we get in too far into the detail design. Do you have a timeline for that? Um, okay. sure. Well, I can't give you a firm date. I'll, get, I'll have to get back to you. Okay. But I think the idea is that anything that's done in, in converting it to use for central processing would be done in a way where it doesn't bias this board's ability to dual purpose it for um, juvenile detention if, if that's the route it ultimately goes. I agree with that. I think ultimately the question is what's the required capacity that we'll need at a detention facility. As you know, the juvenile detention center is a pretty large building right now. And the facilities have to be physically separated, which we can achieve. The question really comes down to um, how many beds do we need? I think my understanding is that you can use a kitchen to serve both, you know, you can transport the meals back and forth, but there has to be a physical separation between the two, which I think we can achieve at the Lima campus. So really you're looking at the part of the building that has a gym, the kitchen, being part of a future juvenile center, whereas the other, you can separate the other part and have it as central processing, provide the office space that's needed for the DA, for the public defender and the other entities that are involved. And as we've talked about and, uh, informally, is also providing space in there for the associated um, even services, contact, social services. So um, I will push that as fast and as hard as I can. I know the urgency behind it. I have seen just what I would call um, just a general general concept, but it's really not much more than a, uh, than a sketch at this time. But we did want to make sure that the public defender, the DA, Judge Kelly were all involved in the discussion. Great. Just to know that, Mr. Chairman, I know I asked about a month and a half ago, the viability of even having juvenile detention and central processing. Can we get a report if the solicitor was able to reach out to the Department of Human Services? Yes. Yes. And Shelly, if you'd like to just take a mic, I mean, that's, oh, great. that's up to okay. you. <laughs> it might be easier than. Hopefully, no one will be sorry to ask me to do that. <laughs> <laughs> I am a lawyer, after all. <clears throat> Um, 
I did uh, communicate with the Attorney General's office, I'm sorry, with the Department of Human Services, the State Department of Human Services. They do not have an objection to us using the facility for that dual purpose. Um, so we're, from that perspective, we're uh, in good shape to move forward. Excellent. All right, any other questions? All right, thank you, Howard. Thank you very much. Um, the next kind of standing item we have on our agendas is any discussion of future um, presentations. Um, so again, if there's any other groups that members of the board would like to uh, coordinate or organize coming in, certainly I, welcome. I don't know that I have something for future presentation, but I would just like to propose that if we're visiting other facilities that we consider Glen Mills, and I know when you say the word Glen Mills, the word pariah comes right after that, but <laughs> I would tell you that Glen Mills has changed. And the reason I'm suggesting that is that when I was um, on the bench, I made a pledge that I would try to visit every place that I would send a juvenile to. And Glen Mills was one of them. But I did not visit Glen Mills because there were juveniles there. I visited Glen Mills because Glen Mills had children who were part of children and youth services and were taken out of the home because of those behavioral problems. And so when I visited the campus, it was more like a cabin. Um, there were no bars. They had their own separate rooms, et cetera, et cetera. And I know that there's litigation going on. I don't know what the status of that is. But uh, if, if, it's, if it's appropriate and we can keep them even closer to their families, I, I think we ought to at least maybe make Glenn Mills a, a possible visit. Let's see what they say and see if that's a possibility. I, clearly, they could not handle perhaps all of the juveniles that we would have there at one time. But there may be a group that. Um, is more appropriate to be at a Glen Mills. So just I just ask that the board consider possibly a visit. That's all. Not making any commitment, obviously. I would agree with uh, Judge Nichols. I mean, what Dr. Spriggs has done at Glen Mills over the past year and a half is extraordinary. And he's a he's a great person and looking to bring that campus forward. So yeah. well, it, they need to get their license back. <laughs> so that's the first yeah, step. Yeah, <laughs> clearly. Yeah, that's that's right. Absolutely. You got to get that back. Yeah. Yeah, and I would agree. I think the, the physical campus should be separated from, you know, what occurred or didn't occur mm -hmm. or whatever mm -hmm. in the past. Mm -hmm. um, and if there's been a sufficient break from that mm -hmm. in terms of management, in terms of staffing, mm -hmm. and you're talking about a, you know, truly a campus that can be a good asset for um, the community, then mm -hmm. I, I see no reason not to. Okay. Imagine. I'd like to see it, but I mean, I've been there for other reasons, but but again, it's not really our decision, right? You know, until it's right. licensed. Until it's licensed. Right. Anything else? All right. Um, any new business? I just had a question for Ms. DiMatteo. Um, the DCIU brought up an interesting um, concept of the day centers. Um, can you talk a little bit about the background on the history of those and kind of what happened to them? <clears throat> Um, in terms of the day treatment centers, I believe Delaware County had two, if not three, over the last 15 years. Uh, the most popular one was our Be Proud Center, which was right in media. Uh, first, as she said, it was um, Southeast Delco. Um, I think generally speaking, I think it was 2018 was our last commitment there. Uh, they did not renew their licensing, um, so they no longer became a resource. And part of the concerns that were raised is the population had drop so significantly that, again, sustaining resources with limited beds is very difficult for these programs because of the amount of staff and expenses that are related to it. And I know that uh, a number of our youth were often uh, denied from Be Proud because of a high level of academic need. So there was a balance there with the day treatment as well as a balance with the community safety. So um, we are, uh, in the process of attempting, we had hoped to do it last year, but um, COVID had something else in mind, um, looking at potentially sending out an RFP for both day treatment and evening reporting to give us some additional resources locally uh, as part of a graduated response model. So we have various things that we can respond to behaviors and violations with now, but having an additional day or evening opportunity um, would benefit us on a graduated response model. Uh, whether or not Be Proud will still be interested or throw their hat into it, I know that when we asked them about their intent to renew their license, 
they were the, the report in 2019 was that they were planning on, and then 2020 they said no, and they have not yet done so. We still use them for our community-based programming. We have an accountability program with them and a summer program, uh, GPS um, uh, program as well. So I just um, this is confusing to me. So there were children who were in the juvenile detention world, and they, instead of being detained in a secure location, were sent to day programs? Yeah, so not, <laughs> I don't know if it was always necessarily um, as an alternative to detention, but certainly we use Be Proud historically as a step down from residential, so where they go from a 24-7 op supervision to a day supervision, you know, with Be Proud, and then home with a monitor and additional community supports as a step down from residential. Um, on occasion, we would use it as an alternative to placement if there were other community, um, other behavioral needs that needed to be met. Um, but you know, you can you can say it about both. I mean, an alternative to placement could potentially be an alternative to detention if the intent is to place, because detention would be the middle ground right. before a child goes up to a higher level facility. Um, but it would not be. Again, I think when you look at the numbers and where we were prior to the closing of the center, those youth um, or the youth that we have there right now, who's one is waiting for both a juvenile outcome and an adult criminal outcome, um, they would be, that would still be a secure detention bed that the court would likely use uh, based on the circumstances. And the children who are um, with only a monitor now what, how are they getting education? Are they would be either getting educated through their, they go their home their, school district their or their, school. their local school or um, in an alternative education program. Um, or some of our kids that are on monitors are not in school. They're older, between you know 18 okay. and 21, I but see. under supervision in juvenile. What's happening with the juveniles that are being detained at outside Places they would be getting the education that's offered at the specific center while they're there. And is, so is there coordination with their their home school district? Uh, the coordination would be similar to the DCIU here at the juvenile detention, uh, would be their facility with their home school district. Okay. Do you think that if we had something like a day center in place, would that help? With, with, do you think that that would be used right now? Well, I think there's a, a population that would benefit, again, from a graduated response model. The more opportunities we have to divert from placement, the better. So certainly um, looking at that to bring that on board would be a plus. I don't believe that that's going to, to offset the need for secure detention or for those particular youth. Um, I suspect uh, once we obtain, um, we've talked briefly, but I'm, Obviously, I'll engage further with Judge Kelly, and then ultimately, as we do with all of our other contracts, you'll see a request for approval to do an RFP, and we'll send it out. I suspect that we'll have a couple of people who might be interested. Again, licensing being a part of it, but I would suspect that Glad Mills might bid on a proposal like that. Be Proud may decide that they're willing to come back um, if they've been able to resolve you know, some of the concerns that they had previously. But the numbers, again, for that particular type of service can be limited. But it is a, f a combination of children that aren't involved in the criminal justice system but are coming through CYS as, as well? I don't know how many youth in recent years um, that Be Proud was getting directly from CYS. Okay. That's what was confusing me. <laughs> like, yeah, I mean, I think over time, we share the contracts, as you, as, as yeah, you know. Right. So we do use each other's services um, as needed. But I don't know that the volume um, was as great for CYS to use that particular service as it was really because it, it gave a further sense of supervision for the youth in that program right. during the day. Right. Um, and they were able to attend to some of the behaviors. But again, they were limited in the type of youth that they would take because of their ability to deal with the behaviors and to what degree. Mm -hmm. And I do believe you did just contract with um, CYS did just contract with Glenn Mills for it. It was on our. Yeah. That's the housing navigator. But it was for how, like, it was for like out of, you know. I don't oh, right. That's the housing navigator. And that's yeah. not a, I don't believe that that's a state issued license. 
right, under the right. community umbrella. They don't that. need the same licensing that they need to right, operate the different. residential or day treatment. Anything else from the board? Mm -mm. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Any other new business? All right. Uh, second round of public comment. Anything from the public? Uh, anything else for members of the board? I was just wondering where our director will be located when he gets here. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Lazarus and I were talking about that today. <laughs> Not sure that there is a an answer at this point, but there are some discussions certainly in the government center okay. somewhere. Right. I think that's is that a fair statement to make? Yeah. yeah. But they're they're looking at options. Okay. We're going to send him home with a monitor. <laughs> <laughs> and on that note, <laughs> I'm going to make a motion to adjourn. <laughs> second. second. Uh, all in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? All right, we are adjourned. Thank you all.